All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Nasher. First things first, make sure you turn off your cell phones because everybody's gonna hear your business if you take a call in here. I'm Curator of Education, Anna Smith, and today it's my pleasure to introduce artist Sarah Z. You know, I wish just a few more people were excited about today's program, but <laughs> we'll just make do with who we have here. Um, I know many of you in this room are familiar with Z's work, and I think it's safe to say that all of us on staff are fans but seeing how she's responded to the Nasher with incredibly thoughtful and immersive works that are both figuratively and literally multi-layered has been a true joy. I know I plan to return and return to these works over the run of the show, and I imagine many of you will want to as well, giving them space to unfold over time. Among her many accomplishments, Sarah Z was awarded a MacArthur Fellowship in 2003 and a Radcliffe Fellowship in 2005. Her work has been exhibited at the Whitney Biennial, the Carnegie International, and in international biennials including Berlin, Guangzhou, Liverpool, Lyon, and Venice. Z's works are held in numerous permanent art collections including the Museum of Modern Art, the Guggenheim Museum, and the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, the Fondation Cartier in Paris, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and the Tate London. Permanent public works include pieces at LaGuardia Airport, the Metropolitan Transportation Authority in New York, and the Seattle Opera House. In 2021, Z unveiled a new permanent commission for the Storm King Art Center, and in 2023, a major solo exhibition of Z's latest work was shown at the Guggenheim Museum in New York. Speaking with Z today is Nasher Chief Curator Jed Morse, whose long and productive tenure at the Nasher has recently brought us the stunning exhibitions Mark de Suvero, Steel Like Paper, and Harry Bertoia, Sculpting Mid-Century Modern Life, each of which was accompanied by a gorgeous publication. I've had the privilege of hearing both our featured artists and our curators speak about this exhibition over the past few days, and I won't deprive the rest of you of that pleasure any longer. Please join me now in welcoming Jed Morse and Sarah Z. Thanks so much, Anna. Um, Sarah, it's such a pleasure to be sitting up here with you. It's, um, for me, it's, uh, well, for us, I'd say it's been a long time coming. We had a pandemic in, in the, in, that, that landed um, between the time that we started talking about this and the time that it happened. So with that factored in, um, it's been about seven years in the, in the making. Um, and a lot's happened in the intervening seven years, not just in the world, but in your work as well. Um, but I, I don't wanna review the past seven years of your work. And actually, Aaron, if you don't mind starting the, uh, the PowerPoint. So for the audience, just so you know, this is going to scroll leisurely through a number of works. And it's starting with uh, an exhibition that Sarah had um, at the Guggenheim Museum in New York um, about six months ago. Um, your work is iterative in that you find you, as you're doing one project, you find new elements that you want to explore more in the next project. And so one builds upon the next, upon the next, upon the next. Just over the past six months, you've done this incredible show at the Guggenheim. You've done uh, an amazing installation for Art Angel at Peckham Rye Station in London. Uh, that has traveled to OGR in Turin. And you've also done another installation at the third Thailand Biennale, uh, which opened in uh, November, December, something like that. Um, and as you see these slides roll by, you'll start to recognize certain themes, certain elements that, that Sarah has drawn out or amplified in the current exhibition here at the Nasher. So, um, I wonder if you can talk about what the past six months of very intense work has been like for you, and how did it bring you to what you wanted to do here at the Sculpture Center? Sure. Thank you. Um, I just want to really quickly say um, it's been a complete pleasure to work in Dallas. 
Um, I feel like the art community in Dallas is really serious and dedicated and warm. Um, I want to do have a personal thank you to Nancy and David Nasher, who have been like brought me in like family. First knew my work, but then immediately you know love art and also I think love artists. Um, and love creating community around art and artists. So that's been really special, getting to know them and getting to know their family. Um, Jeremy, Jed, uh, the Nasher is a really unique place. Um, and it's been, that's part of what, what was really made this work. I think in the end, almost like a garden and almost like an extension of um, many universes within one building. Um, and that's something that comes really from the kind of soul of this place as a place to experience um, what it is to be human through art. So um, thank you all. Uh, thank my team, who is incredible, um, who came here from New York um, to work with me. And my, I have uh, three amazing galleries who I also consider like family and friends. Many of them traveled from those guys from London, from uh, Dallas, uh, not from Dallas, from LA, um, from New York. So thank you so much in particular to Jill Feldman who um, really heralded uh, the, the um, just sort of is always the person who said, we're gonna make this possible and I believe and trust in the work. So that trust is really important. And maybe I'll just jump on, um, Jed and I are really doing this improvisationally, but I just, that idea of trust I think is really interesting and starting with the Guggenheim I'll say, um, and also there's some slides from the biennial here, um, which I think um, Jed was, had, had talked about, we had talked about how there are threads from when I represented the United States um, in 2013, probably around when we first started talking doing this show, even from then there are threads into this show. But um, one of the things I love about, in this building there feels like a lot of trust. Um, and I, I don't use barriers in my work. And in the Guggenheim, that was a huge deal um, for safety reasons, because Frank Lloyd Wright built that building to make barriers actually physically part of the building. Um, you know, they have bibs, they have um, web walls, everything was made so that already sculptures had places to go. Um, and I did not allow there to be anything um, uh, there. I asked that as an experiment, because I think every, um, every exhibition, and this one too, is an experiment. So it's really interesting for me, particularly in the piece upstairs that's called Slow Dance, which has this kind of wave. Like, I didn't know how people would move through it. It's always an experiment. But to me, it's interesting not to have barriers, because I think if you give the audience the trust not to not to touch or not, or to slow down. The audience actually accepts that trust, and it's kind of an amazing thing how you know in, in the biennial no, nothing five five thousand visitors a day nothing was broken in the Guggenheim no accidents reports um, more accident re reports in Gego where there was they were all over there. Um, so I'm really interested in the trust that happens between a viewer and an artist through an inanimate object. Um, and to talk about really what Jed was saying about this kind of um, kind of real jump in the work, I would say, yeah. from the Guggenheim. Um, well, a couple of things happened. Um, it was funny, when I did the biennial, I felt like when I was doing the American Pavilion for the biennial, it was really kind of right before social media exploded. It was in 2013. Um, I felt like I should do a body of work that I was known for, that I had made a body of work and that's what I had gotten the biennial for. And, but when that was done, I felt this incredible sense of freedom, like I could do anything I wanted. And um, things that I had been doing like painting but not showing it, um, a lot of video but not showing it, I just started to put it out in the world. Um, and so if you look sort of post 2013, I started mixing all of these things together and, and everything that I sort of, you know, artists can keep things in their studio and just different artists decide how much they let out. So there'll be artists who like everything from their studio you see. And there's other artists that are very, they, they you know, they really edit. Um, and I just stopped editing. I put everything out there. And um, when I finally, when I finally did the show, 
Um, it was really interesting to do a show at a place that was said, I am a sculpture center um, for me, to say, well, what is sculpture? What does sculpture become? And what is uh, an object? What is physicality um, in an age where, in my own lifetime, the, the physical object um, seems to be disappearing, seems to be confused, seems to be um, amalgamated with um, the non-physical world? Um, on the other hand, I'll make the argument that I think is really important is that um, everything outside our eyes is the physical world. And we talk about the analog and the dig digital as being different, but the digital is a physical thing. And that's something in this sh show you'll see. So in, let's say, in slow dance, when, uh, when there's an edit between uh, one image or another, you'll see it, pic it pixelate, you'll see the edit die, you'll, see, you'll re be reminded that everything there is material, that it's paper, that it's string, that it's pixels. Um, you know, the way the image is formed itself, it, it oscillates between each image being an image and then your eye having to take all of these pixels and put together an image. So just playing on this idea of how the material and the digital are confused all the time. You know, things like, we know this, it happened in post-COVID, which our show got delayed through. Yeah. All of that became accelerated. You know, my parents never would have ordered food online. Now we all can order food online, you know. we have a percentage of the people we know we met first digitally and then you see them in person and you're like, you're not supposed to be that tall. <laughs> but you know, so we're, and my students at Columbia, they'll say, you know, I wanted this red material. Um, it was, it's, it's not the right red because I, when I ordered online, it was this and you know, no, but that's actually the color it is. <laughs> it's not, that's not the wrong red. Um, so I think it's really interesting and it's actually one of the questions I ask um, younger um, students when uh, is asked them, well, what's a time w in your life where the digital and the physical were confused? And actually, the younger you get, the more complex it is. You know, a fourth grade um, student who takes their train to school from Brooklyn to Manhattan said mm -hmm. that when he's reading his physical book, when they go under water, he thinks the book's going to disappear because he's going to lose signal on a physical object. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's, it's completely turned on its head. So there's a lot of that in the show, I think, where you think you're seeing something digital and it's physical, or you're seeing, you're seeing something physical, uh, digital, and it's, and it's not. Um, you know, another example yeah. is in when you walk into the Nasher, I really wanted there to be, you know, this, there's this incredible thrust to the garden, and that's what's so beautiful. I mean, the whole building is like, is portals to a garden, really, in many ways. And so I wanted the sculpture to mimic you know, sculptural things that dealt with the framing of landscape. So, you know, screens, um, uh, curtains, shades, um, but also this kind of mirage of, of, of the real and the, uh, the real, the, the real and the photograph. Um, and this instinct immediately to take, the minute you see something beautiful like that, LA, to take that picture. So if you look at that, it's actually a deconstructed painting. Um, and in yeah. some, sometimes it's great to say, sort of, to like take sort of the most basic questions where when I started making paintings, everyone would say, how do you make these paintings? Because they had collage, they had sculpture, they had oil paint, they they're had- Very physical. They're very physical. Yeah. And so that is actually how the paintings are made. They're, they're layered. So there, it, that's a deconstruction of a painting. But, but uh, the last thing I'll say is that on that is this, this confusion. So I asked Jed to send a couple pictures of that view because I wanted to, I knew that that's where I wanted you to be pulled that, you know, a lot of the time in the Nasher you have a, a, a sculpture up closer. So you come in and it's like sculpture. And, but I wanted you to be confused about what am, I, what am I seeing? And as you got closer, certain things like the horizon line you can only read from far away, but as you get closer, that disappears and details come up. And then if you get really close, you realize that the middle layer of the three layers actually is a photograph of the view out to the Nasher garden. And it's just, a, it's just the, the photograph that Jed sent me because I said, I need a photograph. He didn't know it was going to become part of the artwork. And part of that was I just wanted it to be, you know, 
crummy, not know what, what it was for, reused, like poorly that. digitized, <laughs> <laughs> poorly framed. No, I'm just, exactly. You know, but that, the, this idea that images are in debris, that we're getting them high, low, um, we're all photographers. Um, this idea of like, is it, do we really like seeing better, like higher pixelization on our televisions? I don't. I, I hate it when like, you know, you see like taxi driver and it's like digitized, you know? <laughs> so this idea of mixing those all and you see that in all three pieces, you'll see very high digital images with very low. You'll see ones that I've taken. You'll see one that Jed's taken. Yeah. You'll see um, ones that are bought. So I love this strange idea that um, images are traded like objects. If I want a picture of a volcano, I can buy one and I can go on and I can buy 20 um, and they're being substituted for objects. Yeah. One of the things that I, I've, um, no, I've noticed is just watching the, the kind of shift in your work, just from um, the Guggenheim show to the one here at the Nasher, is there seems to be, I mean, matter, physical objects have been um, a linchpin of your practice from, you know, end of graduate school, I mean, the very beginning, all throughout your career. And in fact, you're, I think you're, you know, you're the kind of iconic work by, by Sarah Z. And if we think of like what you did in, uh, um, in the Biennale in 2013 as kind of you know, the close of, of that chapter of these aggregations of objects where, you know, the, um, the, the sum is, gr you know, is greater than, uh, than the parts. Um, that, I think, um, is something that has followed, but you've added all of these other elements in terms of painting and um, video and, and installation. Just from the Guggenheim show, earlier this year to now, you've seen, I think, a, um, a real kind of distillation of form um, where the physicality of the things that you use has, um, you know, has been kind of distilled to just the essential. Like you, you're not using a lot of objects to kind of have a sense of, of agglomeration or proliferation or you know, a lot of things, right? You're using just the amount of objects you need in order to communicate what you're doing. So there's, there's this kind of distillation of form, but expansion of ideas. Um, and if you look at the um, particularly slow dance, which you see an image of right now, I mean, that installation, it's the, I think the largest video array you've done to date something like that, 722 individually hand-torn pieces of paper, all with projections on them and then more projections on the floor. But it's the only physical part of it are strings and paper and then the tiny little things that, that define the line of the strings on the floor. And that's it. And so I, lo I love that kind of distillation of matter. Can you talk a little bit about, sure, about yeah. that? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because I would use different words. Um, I mean, I think uh, I'm interested in, in the behavior, or the physical behavior of materials. Yeah. So this idea that they're always in a state of, uh, of, 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 that you see process, that they're either becoming or they're dying, and that that moment is live. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, there's this saying that, you know, if this room were burning down, we would take out the people, we would take out the animals, and then we'd take out the art. Because so art is the closest thing to a living, a, a, a living being. Um, and that's an incredible, miraculous idea that we can instill life. You know, it's an old, very old sculptural idea is how do you imbue a material with life? Um, and so I'm interested in when you see something that it's in a state, a state of becoming or a state of dying, as we actually all are. Right. And so I wanted to, to imitate nature in that way. Um, uh, and uh, that's sort of where the like distilling may may come from, I think. Mm -hmm. And I was always interested in the you know um, the space in between things. So it was really important to me that there were three different locations in the Nasher and that they would be very different, but then you'd have a memory of something from one to the next, so you start to collect a kind of internal um, uh, uh, narrative. 
um, and you have your own relationship with the work where you think, wait, the, that dog was upstairs, wasn't it? And I'm having a conversation. That was a decision that the artist made, and I'm, I'm having in the moment. I'm experiencing that decision in the moment. Um, but that it would become a kind of journey or a travel or a pil pilgrimage that is surprising in different ways, but the language has this kind of interiority. So you could see the behavior kind of churn and churn in, 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 in over the time of one place when you enter here. Um, but uh, the other thing that I was interested in, this idea, I think it's a complex idea of like the space in between, um, but all curators and architects think about this a lot, about circulation. What's the first thing you come into? How to entryway? Uh, writers think about it. What's the first sentence in a book? What's the last sentence in the book? How does a character evolve over time? So I'm thinking that way when, when I'm thinking of a show. Yeah. You know, how do you, when you go upstairs, do you return to slow dance and think of it differently because you've seen love song downstairs, mm -hmm. um, you know, or when you go to the garden, you see a cave painting from behind and you, and you have an entire, you didn't, you for, forgot that you would see it through glass. Um, so there are all of these sort of over t the time and space of the, the museum itself, it's almost performative, it's live. You have these live experiences in the space. Um, and so sometimes like, like people would say, I would always say how many, when I was doing objects, they say, how many objects are there? Like, and that, or every review would be toothpicks, uh, to toilet paper, da -da, and there would be a list. And that, to me, it was really interesting because I think it was, you know, the visual, and I think all of you, because you're here, you know, you have, you know, Clive Bell talked about half the talent or more is in the viewer. All of you, because you're here, you obviously find um, a deep um, pleasure and connection with other human beings across ages through an artwork. Um, and when we have that moment, it, it's addictive. You have this feeling of what it is to be human over the ages that you want more. And that's why museums and why I think, you know, through the digital age, people will only want to have these experiences more in real time and real space with real objects, actually, even though they're disappearing. Um, but I was interested, I was sort of I always thought, oh, this is so funny because it's the only language we, we so we're so, like language is so impoverished that we mm -hmm. have to sit, we have to name these things. But when you name them, they mean nothing. They don't, you know, that doesn't describe an installation. It's really their relationship to each other, their relationship to architecture, their relationship to your personal history, to art history. Yeah. They're not objects, so why would you, and everyone, like, and almost every, how many objects are in there? Because there were so many. So anyways, one of the things I did was I decided that in, slow dance, we would just show you it was going to count. And so it counts one third, um, and it says, and you see the computer counting. And then, so you have part, part of these things that are, that are just really operative tools that we had to use ourselves being shown. And then part of them that I thought were funny, because so I decided that like when it came to one third, it would just blank like this, that number. And that blinking to me was like when some of us are of the age where remember when you would type on the computer and when you stopped, it would just do this until you, <laughs> so it would be like thinking and then you keep typing. And so it was like stopping and then it keeps going and then you realize if you wait for the whole cycle that it, by the end it gets to, you know, the 174. Um, but, it's, but it gives you these breaks, um, almost like a verse or like a song. Um, and the way that one was um, composed was really um, this idea that it almost had breaks like, a, like in poetry where you would have a repeating verse or in music where you would always have like an underlying bass. Um, so there are certain, like this, like there's certain, like that one's all, there's, there's certain groupings. So that's all one subject matter. So that's all sun and it's in color. There's ones that are all one subject matter that are in black and white. Um, and then there's one thing that is called things caused to happen. And in the Guggenheim, it'll come up. I think we'll just let it run. Yeah, yeah. But um, in the Guggenheim, there's a piece that's round. Um, and it was called Things Caused to Happen. And it was, it was the first time where I took um, uh, this series of images and each image is totally different, um, but it's constantly on at the Guggenheim. Um, and here it comes up and you sort of, I think, find an Im image and you kind of also know that you're finding an image that someone else isn't. 
there's also that like lack of hierarchy in terms of telling you this is important, this is what you're supposed to look at. It's, it's a sense of wandering, which is actually something I think I learned when I lived in Japan, which was with Japanese gardens, this idea of they're completely, um, you know, the narrative is one of discovery. That you, it's not like Versailles where you're like, this is where I'm going to get the best view. Um, it's where you have these little moments of discovery and, and this idea of wandering. Um, mm -hmm. So in each of them, you have the sense that of the things caused to happen that you're wandering and you see it come back and you say, oh, I can go back to the sun. But I just saw there, you know, there's a fox running across. So each time you kind of gather, and so you become a collector of images yourself, an active collector of images. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting that you've incorporated imagery and uh, particularly, you know, photographs, um, moving imagery within your body of work because. Um, you were talking earlier about you know even the digital is something you know has a physical presence and exists it exists in our space um, because you know all of these little things that everyone loves to kind of you know name as they're writing reviews of the show all the things that kind of make up the work of art which are all things that we don't pay any attention to in our everyday lives I mean it's tape it's string it's paper I mean. You know, things that you, and you, you mean, you pull in everything that you've got around the studio, just, you know, little things. Um, and oftentimes it's things that were used to actually make the work of art that's on view. Um, and it's amazing, the re I think one of the reasons why they like to list all of the stuff is that all of that insignificant stuff suddenly takes on a really kind of palpable meaning. I mean, it, and that's, that's what sculpture is all about, you know, making meaning of that kind of inert thing. Um, and it's, it's fascinating that imagery has, has entered into that vocabulary of, again, it's, all, it's almost like it's the, you know, it, there's so much imagery that we're exposed to nowadays that like, it just kind of washes through us. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't have any, you know, we don't notice it, um, but it has, an, it has an effect on us. So it's that, and now that's the insignificant kind of commonplace material that you're using to say, you know, this, to, to make meaning with. Yeah, I mean, I think, but I think one of the, one of the things that, um, that is important to me about the use of images is that is I'm interested actually, and I figured this out with the when I really had to like was making paintings and thinking about images and paintings, um, as I'm interested in the percentage of images that are in, that's inside our heads, and that we are so conscious of what's outside our heads, but that you know, you know, like sitting up here, I can remember, I'm having like, I'll have a flashback to 2016 when I gave a talk at here, yeah. you know, and then I'll think about, oh, who, you know, where was I staying? And there are all these images happening in our head and, you know, different neuroscientists will have different theories and we may never know, but, you know, you could, we could, we could even propose that like 90% of the images in 24, in a you know 24 hour period or 48 hour period, like we're dreaming, we're imagining, we're remembering, we're hoping. Um, all of those things are subconsciously happening all the time, um, and and the way we actually create meaning or memory over time is really interesting to me. Through whether it's through a smell, through music, through an object. Um, and so a lot of these images are actually, in my mind, hearkening to um, the way you experience them is one of recognition, um, of remembering something, even though it's not your memory, it's, you have this sense of discovery. So one of the goals always for me, whether what, no matter what medium, was that when you went into a museum, a space, let's say, here, or a subway station, you know, and that the sense of, the, the actual active sense of seeing an artwork would be one of discovery, um, one of recognition, one of intimacy. Um, interest, really interested in the idea of how does something become intimate because I think that that's very much what keeps us as human is when we reach that point of intimacy and that the value of intimacy. And so um, that's actually 
how I want the images to come. I don't want them to be exterior images. I want them to be interior. And so actually one of the most important things in um, the more recent work is sound. Right. And so the sound in this piece is actually, it's, um, it's just right because you actually don't even realize it's happening completely. And we, and we you know, it takes forever. And when it's wrong, it's awful. Like it doesn't work at all if it's on the wrong volume. Um, and I also, it was interesting to me during COVID, I did do some, I did some, I did an install at the, uh, in Paris um, and I had to do it necessarily almost completely remotely. And um, but then I got this like special visa to go there. Like uh, I became like an essential worker, and I went and they installed the entire thing. And um, the one thing that was just completely wrong was the sound, because you can't, like, you couldn't do the sound over video for digital, because sound is so sculptural, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and so it's just, an, it's an, it's an interesting. Thing in these pieces because what the sound, the, the note that the sound had to hit was almost this, this thing was a kind of a hum mm -hmm. and the kind of hum that like when you're humming, you're actually not realizing that you're singing you're, and you're, your brain is doing something else. So to, to sort of put you in a place where you're not, where you're, where, you know, I think many of us in our different professions, we have sometimes our best ideas like in when we least expect having them, right? Because we're distracted or we're not, and you can sit down in your studio or at your desk for an hour and be like, or write that paper you have one. And this one moment is when like that, when it will happen. Or, you know, it's like this one moment you fall in love. You can't, you can't make these things happen, right? And so I wanted the, the tone in the spaces was to try to put you in a mindset where um, you're actually, your, your senses are heightened because you're you're being distracted somehow, um, and I think just I'll just last thing I think that's interesting is things like ASMR, like these like obsessions with cooking shows, with making things, with craft, with seeing the the physical in the digital is kind of an incredible. Who knew that's but people would spend hours and hours or would want to go to bed to this. <laughs> you know, it's like that. It's a it, so it's the most like sort of basic physical things then being translated into the digital that can, that can actually be um, really interesting. But I will say the one thing I said, I gave a really, a tour to a much smaller group, um, but just by chance, because they were here. Um, and I will say, I think that the digital as a medium, I'm really interested in like, what a painting can do that a sculpture can't do. Like those of you who, anyone who, I never lived with my work, but my husband was like, we're bringing work to our house and we're bringing, we're bringing that, I want that in my house. So <laughs> it's really, really interesting because a paint, to me, and people have argued in this, but paint, a painting will make a space, makes more space. You can put a painting on that wall and I can go 50 miles. But if you put a sculpture, it actually, it's there, it's in physical space. Um, and I think that, um, what the digit and and so 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 painting can create this portal into your mind. With a sculpture, you can go up and be like, I know what's real. It's not if you want. You're, and, yeah. and it's in your room. It, it takes up room in space, space in your it's, room. It's, and yeah. you can walk around it. You can yeah. break it. You can do things to it yeah. to find out what it is. Um, but with the digital, I think that the what it leaves us. Actually, someone last night was saying that it gives you desire, but actually, I think it gives you longing. And I think longing is like a very it's real. It's not it's 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 not a necessarily a criticism, let's say, of right. of, of the digital. It's part of the, the the spectrum of human emotions. And someone like Durr, you know, yeah. uh, melancholia, like these were their main subjects. Rembrandt, we could say. Um, and and that's you know catacol. It's the, these can are important. Um, it, it's an, it can be your medium is to talk about sorrow, and it can be a, a very very powerful medium because it's part of our spectrum. But I think the yeah. digital medium, um, its most powerful use um, is to create longing, because you always want the smell, you always want <laughs> the taste, you always want the touch, you always want to know what's to the left or to the right. You never get the whole thing. Um. Yeah, it's you know it's interesting. It, it, I mean, I, I I I feel that in both slow dance upstairs and love song down here, um, and you know you were earlier you were talking about kind of the humming and how that's something that you you do unconsciously as you're thinking through other things in your mind and 
And you had talked about wanting that sense of interiority, in particular with, with slow dance upstairs. And, and I think, you know, the, the, you just kind of, um, you know, you, you, um, you fall into the, tr the trance that it, it, it brings by the change of the images, the sounds that either align or don't align with it. Um, the humming, which again kind of puts you inside your head and talking about the images. It's like the images that play inside your head. But this, and the, but this idea of longing, I, I also connected really strongly with um, Love Song downstairs. Um, but, and, and it was interesting, you said longing. I was thinking nostalgia, which has all kinds of historical meanings, but just that, but really because it, it, it carries also that sense of, of longing, whether it's, you know, f um, usually for something that's not present. And so you're talking about like, you, you're, you wanna know what it smells like, you wanna know what the sounds are like, it's the, it's the part of the image that's just outside of the frame, you know. Um, so I would like- But there's also that sense of like, the way that it is, um, it is representing nature, mm. Just like you know, the garden is is actually not nature; it's representing nature because it's artifice. Sure, right? It's a parking lot. It's it's a parking <laughs> lot that we made into a garden, right? And it's in the middle of a city. So how much you know how how and it's very it's also very you know rectilinear. I'm joking. I mean, it's, yeah. a, it's an incredible haven. It's it is an incredible haven, but it's a constructed one, sure. right? You know, and. And I think that's one of the things that Love Song Downstairs does, is it kind of points up this, this sense of um, longing, longing to be in nature, because you have all these incredible images of scenes from, you know, scenes of, you know, very, sometimes very recognizable places like Monument Valley, or, um, or this, you know, those wonderful images of, of swirling flocks of birds, and, um, and the shadows of the tree, which, just looks like the shadows of a tree, but the tree is made out of, you know, arm sculpture armature wire and photographs of leaves, not actual leaves, not actual branches, you know, the things that an artist uses to make a representation of nature. Um, and it just, it made me think a lot about how the artifice of that sculpted tree it mirrors in a way kind of the artifice of, of the kind of constructed garden that we have. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm, I, that's not yeah. a question. No, no, no. So, so I, <laughs> but maybe, it, no, maybe it's something that. Because uh, we only have words, we yeah. have images. So, uh, so it's just interesting, I'm thinking as you're talking, because yeah. so nostalgia is a word like I would completely reject in my mind, yeah. but just because um, I, I always did particularly with objects, because mm -hmm. one of the things that I thought was interesting was how could you take something like this that is has, zero nostalgia value, zero like emotional value, and then put it in a context, in a, in a sculpture where I felt sorrow and longing. So if you take like a, you know, a teddy bear that's like the eye, one eyeball is off of it. And, like we all, like that, like that was a, I was completely, you know, anything that had been used by another human being, I wanted, that was too easy to, so, right. so I'm thinking, so, I, but I was thinking about it is, am, am I, you know, I'm challenging myself in it. So, cause I think there's nostalgia, there's, I still like a little bit cringe at that, at that word, but I think in my work, but I think um, there's, um, I'm interested in taking something like the, like the medium of film or video mm -hmm. or photography and showing it in a way where like, you know, the texture of it can be so beautiful in different forms. And of course there's this nostalgia now, like, you know, 13 year olds are trying to get like the little, like, you know, the, everyone wants like the, the Canon camera that like we had not so long ago, I had one yeah. to carry around in their pocket. Like that's the big, and those pictures are like, they look totally different than what you get on the iPhone and we, we want that. But that's a, for, that's form. It's like the, like it's, a, it's I'm interested in the reminder that, you know, that's like using a sable brush versus, you know, um, mm -hmm. like an acrylic brush uh, and using, you know, a little more Damar varnish in it. Then with that, that photography and video is this like incredibly become this incredibly dexter, like you can have dex be dexterous within it. You can um, really play with it. And then I think, you know, it's changing so quickly, but you know, it's just like with, let's say, 
screens, like more pixels was better. It's not better, it's just a different look because yeah. it's all artifice, right? Yeah. So it's like, do you want to use more, you know, turpentine and make it washy? Mm -hmm. Should, is, it's not, there's this sort of, there's this kind of strange thing, like it was better with more digital and actually things looked awful, right? And people would look, so, I mean, but it wasn't that it looked awful, it looked dated. Right. right, so yeah. photography looks dated, but there's something like so. For example, I was thinking, is it nostalgic? I was thinking, like, am I am I like, well, like the, I guess the reason I went with no, nostalgia is because it involves memory, right? It involves mem, yeah, it involves yeah. memory. But um, sure, but so, but I was thinking, like, in terms of like whether, but it involves memory. Yeah. But what I want to do with the with my viewer is I want the viewer to make that move, not me. Right. I don't want to tell you this is nostalgic. I want you to go to it and say, oh my God, I, that totally reminds me of mm. when like my first lover left me on that train. But like, like how did, but no one else, is, is anyone else gonna have that feeling? Right. I don't want to tell them that that's what this is about, let's say. Um, but so, so the nostalgia, nostalgia comes from your own memories, right? So I want you to elicit what a memory looks like in your head and how we're forming them. But I don't want to give you a memory. I, I want you to find your own in it. But then I was thinking, so I was, I was challenging myself as I was doing it. I was like, turning, I need to take notes when people are in because I'm like, oh, I have 17 ideas to respond to you. <laughs> but one thing that was sort of interesting in that's an object that could be argued as nostalgic is um, in the in the piece downstairs um, in Love Song, um, it was really important to break up that that tree because I didn't want it to be the rep. You also use this rep word, which I was also that cringing about. Like I was right, representing right, right. a tree because yeah. to me it is a tree, but it's also a projector. It's also a shadow maker. Right. It's also a photograph. It's also yeah. a sculpture. So it's this idea, it's also a painting. Um, but it was really important to break up the tree by putting in one more. Um, what I saw is like a portable found object that yeah. was made to be like a portable studio, yeah. whether it was a camera, um, a tripod, like everything that hits the floor is a tripod. So it's this idea to me of like a sculpture that you set up somewhere and you have your, in, your, your, your studio is portable. And this idea of like, a, you know, making any, bringing a sculpture and anywhere it goes, it makes uh, you know, it makes, um, it, it becomes site specific is really interesting to me. Um, like a kiosk, uh, like Russian, I was always really interested in Russian kiosks as a sort of, like portable uh, system of uh, the spread of information or ideas. So th that's very important to me. That, like the, the objects in there are all, you can fold them up, you can, you know, put them in your back. So there's a the plein air painting um, setup, but instead of a painting, um, it, where the painting would be, you have a projection, and on that projection is on a postcard. Right. And um, to that, you could argue, like the, post, the postcard as an object is, if you want to, if I were debating myself, I would say, <laughs> you know, that was a nostalgic decision. Right. But to me, it was very important that it wasn't like a postcard from my mother when I was at camp. Right, yeah. It was like, it's, a, it's an off the shelf postcard and if you want to spend time, you can actually look. There are a bunch of postcards, and they're all postcards that from the Hubble telescope. Right. And like the one that's being projected on is, uh, which I thought of as, a, which I considered as a title for the piece, is um, Winter Approaching Saturn. Yeah. And then you see that. So you have that, then you have the postcard, and you have the trade of images, like the trade of images through the postcard. Yeah. And this idea of you know how you shared, uh, like what it was like to be, to have gone to the Taj Mahal, like what I was, I'd send you a postcard, um, but then it all layering back into now. Now it's actually this video from my iPhone from the Taj Mahal <laughs> instead of the postcard itself. Right, right, yeah. Snail yeah, mail. It, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and the inclusion of the um, the plein air painting easel. Yeah. I, it was another thing that just brought me straight to, you know, artifice, you know, the, because, you know, you had these artists who were going out into nature and they were, you know, painting paintings quickly. Then they were taking them back to their studio and they were repainting them as kind of idealized visions, right? Um, and, but that, know, is that always true? I don't think that's always true. It's not, not necessarily. I mean, in, in like, say, 19th century American landscape painting, it was invariably, you know, unless it's like a little sketch that they did. But they're always making decisions that are artistic decisions and not like I'm trying to capture what I'm seeing right. visually. They're always making 
decisions about composition and not just like where they set up their their canvas and the view that they're seeing. Sure. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're constructing it. But in some ways it's like, to, I would argue the opposite. I would say it's like the most, it's like the least art, artifice in that idea that like the, the plein air painting was like, I'm painting in, in the air, in the yeah. environment. And I mean, we talked about it, but I, you know, it was like, there's these famous stories of that, I think that are true, that Whistler, like Whistler actually strapped himself to a mast in a storm, and and they couldn't move. Like he's, and like it's the great like you know artist um, giving you know sacrificing their life for their art story. And so because he said, I want to understand. I want. I don't want to paint the storm. I want to paint what it is to be in the storm, right? And you know, and I. I mean, I don't. I actually don't think Van Gogh was going back and being like, I need a pedal there. I think. You know, and like when I went to Provence, I was like, wow, the, these are the real colors. Like I, <laughs> I thought they were making this up, but it's yeah. like that light is that light, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and so to me, I think. You know, I don't think Monet was yeah. going back with Chartres and being like, I think I'll make this one purple. Sure. I think he was like, that's what this light looks like. Because when you have sunset and it hits, you know, the Nasher at, at five o'clock, it's actually a lizard and crimson. And that's like amazing, yeah. right? And so, so to me, actually, um, you know, it's it, like one thing that art can do is it, rem, it remind you how spectacular reality is. So that was one of the things about like stopping you before you went to the alley yeah. was like like de delaying that gratification of being like, you know, even if you've been here before, like I'm going to rush out. It, it to me it would emphasize that when you turned that it was like the alley then it became this incredible rush. Um, because it, because that painting and all of these all of these works play with perspective mm -hmm. in different ways. So it, they play with like, the two most traditional ways to play with perspective. I'll just pro I'll propose right, yeah. are you know one point perspective, uh, you know uh, when you're trying to do depth on a on a one on a singular plane, like and, gritting it out orthogonally, and or or, try, or or trying to create a flat object giving you dimensional space, right? right. So there's like Renaissance space. And then there's isometric, that, you know, there, there's this kind of something that was used much more in Asian and really well developed, you know, in Japan, what closed for years and no one had seen these images. It opens the impression to see these images that are where the, the development of perspective in an entirely different way is so advanced, um, which they stole immediately, which I played <laughs> with in that room, which was like that Van Gogh stole all these things from like Hiroshige and, um, and hoax eye of like putting a branch right here hmm. and then seeing like that elevator. Um, and that's what the branch, you, there's this moment hopefully where you like you feel you're in the environment because the branch, you, you imagine that your eye is trying to like see through the bushes mm -hmm. to these long landscapes. Um, and so that, that changes and is really interesting. Like, so one thing that I read that I think is interesting is that we are seeing actually, the younger generation is seeing much more um, and, and learning to draw and learning to depict things much more in isometric because with things like video games or if you want to go see you know, the, the show at the Met and you get a three-dimensional walkway, um, this, the, uh, the computer can't use one-point perspective because if you turn a corner when you're using one-point perspective, it doesn't work. Isometric allows you to turn a corner and see things. So we've actually gone back in this age to using that as a tool mm -hmm. that our brains are starting to, we, you know, that we see, the more we see it, the more we learn how to like see things that way. Right, yeah. It's, um, I mean, thinking about space and the depiction of space and, um, and particularly the, uh, cave, the piece cave painting upstairs in front of the garden, you know, one of the things that struck me was that it, it mirrors the, the kind of architecture. And, you know, Renzo used to talk about um, the Nasher Sculpture Center being kind of um, uh, a series of veils or a series of planes. There's, you know, there's, there's the plane of the city, uh, then there's the plane of the galleries, and then there's the plane of the garden. So you have this kind of um, series of frames, essentially, um, and you see through all of them. And, and that's what that piece is, is doing in a sense is that you know, you're seeing, but it's confusing it because you've got in the middle of it the view of the garden and then after you pass it, the view of the garden. Um, 
I, can we, I want to talk a little bit about, about architecture, just because you've worked in so many incredible spaces. Um, I mean, you know, from modernist masterpieces like the Guggenheim to, um, you know, it, incredibly evocative um, and historically, um, you know, compromised buildings like the Haus der Kunst in Munich, um, you know, to abandoned um, waiting rooms in, in train stations. And so, and also you were trained as an architect and your father is an architect. And so you've been thinking about space and architecture for a long time. And I'm, I'm just curious, you know, you know, how do you approach a new space when you're, when you're given an opportunity like this? Yeah, I mean, I talked a little bit about how I, I wanted to think about um, things that sculpture did and, the, mm -hmm. and play around with what, a, like pull sculpture to its edge because this was a sculpture center. Yeah. Um, so to have it be, you know, like gravity, um, uh, you know, weight, mm -hmm. um, sculpture in the round, um, circulation, things that like are actually like more than the, the meat and potatoes, the main language of sculpture than of let's say a painting you normally. Um, so that idea that you would have a place that really was examining sculpture to me was interesting. Um, I mean, I think this building is, is uh, incredible um, on so many levels. I think it's, I, I, I said this to you, but um, you know, I've been here many, many times and it's interesting to see anything in artwork, a piece of music, um, uh, you know, building age. And this building, it looks brand new, contemporary, alive, um, as alive as I think the day, I wasn't here the day it was built, but it feels like that. It has this kind of epic, classic, um, uh, new use of language, because obviously it was using, like, ro you know, this idea of a kind of Roman ruin, um, which I think is interesting. I don't know if he talked about it, but I think it's interesting that he, it, I think it comes from the Felix, Philip Johnson Glass House, um, who he talked about how he looked at um, buildings that were destroyed after wars and that they would always be the chimney. Right. And so the, so the Glass House just has the chimney. So you have the bearing wall structure and then you have this pavilion around it. And so that, the Glass House was just that, it was, it was the fire, right? right? I mean, what's interesting about this building is it's also the, the idea of the Roman room and like all of America is all of these bearing wall structures pretty much all of them, unless you go to like the Northeast Coast. I think, I'm gonna propose that, thinking if that's true in Dallas, they probably have them. But anything that's built like since the invention of steel isn't bearing wall. So these are not like bricks on bricks. These are brick face, right? Yeah, it's, so, it's stone so cladding. So this whole idea of the, um, the uh, again, it's almost pictorial. It's the, mm -hmm. it's the, um, it's the imagination of gravity, and it's also the um, the presence of the idea of gravitas. That these buildings, like these walls, are heavy. They're weight. They're actually not. Like you can peel them off, and they're. But it was so. The whole building is a, a kind of artifice sculpture of these like Roman room, and and same with the LA. I mean, it's amazing. You go out and you're like, oh my god, I'm in France, right? <laughs> so, but right. but it was but but it's off center. So. Yeah. You know, this idea that these are the heavy buildings, the, the things that have lasted forever, right, obviously, yeah. are not. Right, that kind of patina of age. You know? but, it's, yeah. but, it's, but, he, but he plays with that. He's, mm -hmm. It's playful. I mean, Renzo is always playful. There's always it's humor. It's a conscious use of that. Um, yeah. And, so, and, the, and he, he, he deals with lightness in this incredible way. So to have these, like, ceilings that allude to the sky, um, it was incredible yeah. and incredibly effective. And, and the garden is as important as the building, right? And that's such an amazing, I mean, as I said, I think the garden, the building is a portal to the garden. I mean, mm -hmm. the arps uh, with the garden behind them is like, you know, it's like nothing you've ever seen. Yeah. It's like a breath to go through and they suddenly look so light, right? Yeah. It takes all of the gravity out of them. Um, so, so I mean, every building for me is a conversation. It's yeah. like, it, it's, you know, it, usually it's a marriage. I'm not really interested in fighting a building. Sure. Um, it, it's a, um, it's a, I'm usually interested in looking at a building and saying, here's what its successes are in my mind. And in, and here are maybe what its failures are and actually focusing on its successes. Um, and um, it's in, I, I, some, I, it, it's a weird thing because we, I would not have probably darkened the upstairs room, but I also like to sort of work with what's given. Mm -hmm. um, and the show, and, and at a certain point, Jed was like, you know, the show's gonna be darkened 
And I also need time. Like before, I said this once a long time ago, if you give me time, you give me a location, you give me a budget, you'll get a piece. Right? <laughs> and like if we were going to take down, because the show before had darkened that room, um, if we were going to take that down, that would take like four days off of our installation. So that's also just a really practical thing. It was like, oh, well, if we keep the walls and I'll make that part of the piece, and it's just like, you know, even there's something in, in me that the, like yeah. tearing the walls down and throwing them out that we do in the art world all the time. I was like, yeah. okay, so interesting. This is a new challenge because I always thought this would be, you'd go down, it would be this underground, it'd be like a terrarium. I love that you would see, like you would anticipate this world that you get to through by using the glass as a screen before you come in and then you'd be completely immersed down here. It's like the, it's the architecture is perfect for that. And when I did my lecture here, I was like, I know I'm gonna do that space sometime. <laughs> you know, um, but I didn't anticipate doing another um, video upstairs. Um, but when it was closed, I thought this could actually be really interesting and really surprising because it's not maybe I don't know if you you don't usually do video up there. No. Um, and so <laughs> and so it'd be a surprising way. And I thought it'd be interesting to go through light to dark to light when you go through those three and have each of those are like an incredible reveal. Yeah. You know, going from the entryway to to um, you know to slow dance and then to, to ARP is also like a really I I always think about like the the other shows as part of the experience right. uh, for the viewer. So. Kind of the memory of the space. For, yeah. Yeah. And then that that is the biggest I would say experiment for me that it's really interesting and I'm actually really interested in like seeing how people move through it. Um, I think every installation is, it's an experiment because they don't know how, what the audience is gonna do. I mean, my favorite thing about the Guggenheim show is that apparently for circulation, they had to time um, how long anyone stays on a bay so that they know how, to, how many people to let, let in. And because that's actually a tourist attraction in and of itself, it has a huge population that don't even care what artist is there. They're just coming in. <laughs> and like it's amazing because their language is from all over the world. And, yeah. and I actually love that. I love public artworks because people are like, is that art? They don't know. I love having that audience. Yeah. But they have to be very careful about timing of, of uh, audience. And so apparently for the ring where the show was they had to triple the time that people stayed on the bay and so that was kind of the, the best compliment that yeah. people like slowed and that they stayed yeah um and and that was an experiment yeah. and it was an experiment not to have barriers and so i think that piece is like the biggest experiment mm -hmm. for me um because uh i didn't even know where you would in making it where you would want to stand um, I was really interested in making a place where there wasn't an object, there isn't a clear, there is a center, but it's not clear that that's the best view. Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways, I think something I didn't know would happen is that I think probably the best way to view that piece is, is in movement, to go behind it, to go around it. Um, to see it fall apart from different angles, but is your is maybe from the walls where you so it's almost like an arena. Right. It's almost like you know going to see a tennis game or going to see you know going to watch like a happening, and you're actually you know you're you're experiencing it, but you're experiencing it as an audience. And experiencing a great performance as an audience is a, is it's not that you're on the outside of it. Like being a, a spectator is an incredible. Right, you're, performative you're there. experience. Yeah. yeah, you're present. Yeah. yeah, so that's that. So I think that's for me really interesting. I didn't, you know, I don't know. I'm not. I don't know because I need to see more people in it. But right. that's a really interesting idea about that piece and the way it dissolves and grows as yeah. a reflection to the center, um, and and that happens totally different. And you kind of know by chance, like that's right. by chance. Like I didn't know what it would do on the floor, really. Right. I mean, I could guess, but we didn't, we, you know, it was, we're modeling the video on a, a screen as big as that, that you know? <laughs> sure. Um, so, so that's a very exciting piece for me because I think it's, I, I've never seen anything like it before for me. And right, that's right. always the best kind of piece you can make as an artist when you're like, I had no idea that's what would happen. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, it, and it's amazing how you know, those, the two sides kind of mirror each other. Um, and there's, there's a relationship in that the images either, you know, completely mirror each other or they travel from one side to the other. There's this kind of conversation between the two of them. Um, and then there's like the inverse because the shadows that are cast, you know, through the paper right. on the back sides of them. Um, it's kind of like, 
the thing that's happening and then, you know, the, the kind of memory of that thing, thing yeah. on the other side. Yeah, on the walls. Yeah. Uh, which, the walls, which in most museums are like, you know, didn't, there was, who was in it, Picasso? Someone said that oh, sculpture is something that you bump into when you're looking at a painting. Yeah, I think it's often, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, attributed to Ad Reinhardt. Oh, is it Ad Reinhardt? Yeah, okay, yeah. but I love that, that <laughs> walls are actually kind of, the remnant is actually quite, like, is a, could be the projection, but yeah. it's a, really just the leftover. But I just, I was thinking as you were talking, I also want to thank you um, and Jeremy uh, just for being there, from my experience, but being here was very much like you could bring the studio here yeah. and that there was no expectation that, you know, uh, that, the, the, you know, as an artist, you could really try anything you wanted and do anything you wanted. And that's not always the case because there's constant, there can be a real feel of fear of failure or the protection of like knowing, oh, this is, you know, you, you, I mean, you probably have like the favorite piece that you like of mine. And there was never like, we want this kind of work. We want, and so for me, what's really fun about this show is that they're all, I mean, they're all new, they're all fresh, they all change dramatically. The piece down here, what, what, we, we tripled it in size on site. Yeah. Like the, you know, the, the plein air video wasn't in it. Um, and there was just, we, I was given a lot of freedom as an artist to try things. And I hope that that actually is, I do think that the experience the artist is given, when, I hope and I think it can happen, yeah. is actually given to the audience. Yeah, um, so. well, that, that brings us back to trust, which brings us full circle to the beginning of the conversation. Maybe this is a good point where we can open it up to questions from the audience. If anyone wants to ask a question. shadows. Oh, thanks. Um, did, could you hear at the beginning of the question or do you need to repeat? Uh, if you, it, why don't you go ahead and repeat it and that okay. way everyone sure. can hear. Yeah, so I just uh, am curious how much in your mind you're thinking of the space uh, when it is full of viewers like it's been you know for opening in particular you see shadows of people's profiles you know in the projections you're you know and talking about where to stand upstairs you know, when there's people all in the room, that sort of affects where people are going. And it, to me, felt very much like the the viewers are elements of the sculpture. And do you think about in those spaces of the viewers at being a layer of the sculpture itself? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I'm absolutely thinking about that. Um, and I think that's one of the things that's really interesting about slow dance is that it's it's confusing to know because it's changing all the time. When you feel like you're in the middle of it, suddenly you're not, um, and then you know you're being lit by the side, or you're being, you know, it's it's disappearing. That that no, that noise that's like, that's actually um, cards going being like. So when you hear that, you're, you feel it over your body. Um, like last night, a, a whole bunch of people showed me pictures they'd taken of themselves in it, and they were amazing. Uh, things that I, you know, didn't know would happen. Um, and and I think it also gets you to move because you want to see how people are moving. Um, I actually don't do Instagram, but I have an account, and I use it to hash. This sounds really crazy, but I don't know why everyone doesn't like do this. There's like you can hashtag a thing, and then you can search it. So if you hashtag, I'll hashtag my name, and then I'll see what how other people saw the work, mm -hmm. and that's like an incredible thing. And so, um, like one thing that happened in in the Guggenheim was that where you could get a shadow. There was all all these people did these beautiful self-portraits of themselves in shadow. In Thailand, it worked much more almost like a Kusama mirror box, and people were like, everyone went in and got a selfie. It was just the different shape of the room. Um, and here, you can, there, there's these incredible moments where uh, you, like, you become part of the piece. There was one part in the Guggenheim that, that did that, and there was a, you could get an amazing photograph. But here, I think it's actually, I hope that people, it's kind of, you know, a strange, almost like a Felix Gonzalez Torres dissemination into the world idea that I hope that people use it, not just like, you know, um, you know, 
a selfie. I would, I just, some of the videos are from India. We came up from India and there's actually like selfie stands of Modi all over India. Not like a selfie stand, but this like kind of idea of um, reimagining and remaking your own work within the piece and then actually disseminating that in the world. Um, and so for me, it's really fascinating because I'm actually going in and looking and and seeing how other people are using the work as a tool to become an image maker. Because I think in some ways, I actually had this moment in the middle of the Guggenheim where I was like, what am I doing? This is like, it was like, you know, it was, there was a lot going on. <laughs> and I was like, well, what is the thing I'm doing? And I realized, oh, each of the bays is an image making system. And the sculpture is making the, video, the image, the image is making the sculpture. Everything is interdependent to, they're actually making each other. So when the viewer comes in, it completes the work, right? I mean, many artists talk that way. But that, what's interesting about these pieces is they actually, because we all have phones, people start making their own images and they become image makers within this image making system. So I, I love that. Other questions? Yeah. There's a microphone coming. Thanks. Hello. Um, I, you've sort of answered this a bit with like the perspective and like your system, but I'm interested in, in like the overall form of each one. Like I see these things repeating like orbs and like the hammock kind of like um, strings that go down and then sort of like helices. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if that's like, if there's like anything you want us to know about like the like overall like shape and form mm -hmm. that your work takes. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. And I mean, it's such a sculptural question. So, you know, the hammock, which actually is very much related to, to slow dance and these pieces, they're catenary, so they're being, I mean, they're being made by, by gravity. So they're like, you know, if you just take a string and hold it from here to here, it does the most beautiful thing, like, right. you know, in real space. Um, you know, the pendulums are like the oldest way to measure, you know, or, you know, from ceiling to floor is to use, you know, so these really old sculptural things um, that, will perform like incredible feats by almost doing nothing. Um, the slope is actually extremely complex because I wanted it to be, and it did things that I didn't even imagine. When you photograph it, it actually almost sometimes looks like it's convex, um, weirdly. But um, I, I was thinking partially about how when you photograph um, a lot of photo studios, they want to get rid of the architecture and they don't want edges. So you have a, you have a sloped wall and what that would do to your, to your sense of the architecture, how to kind of kill the, the solidity of the walls. But once you, as you can imagine, when you put a slope of strings the same length, once you put one piece of paper on it, that goes down. So the whole thing is very carefully balanced. Um, and it's almost like a game, because I, I wanted to get a shape that felt organic. Um, that didn't feel like a computer made, but was made through actual, the need of the weight. So it was a game of taking away um, uh, pieces of paper and adding pieces of paper to get the slope to work. So it's super sculptural and sculptural space. You couldn't, like the mathemat, if you did a mathematic equation, it would be insane to do that. But actually, um, and not to call her out, but Nancy made a really nice comment when she came in early, really, we were doing, she asked me about that shape and no one asked me about that shape. Um, and I really needed a shape because I didn't want it to be a screen, right? Everything about that space is like, it's, you think it's a screen and you're reading it, but it's not. They're pieces of paper, they're string, they're not straight, there's two of them. Um, and then it is a screen because we're reading this a screen. Um, but she made a nice comment because she said it related to the ARP because the ARP also is about these, these forms that they elude nature, but they're never, they're figurative, they, they're, you know, they're natural, but they're never fully, that's what I meant about like the half of it's in the viewer. Yeah. Like we're making them figurative. They're not telling, they're not fully giving us all of that. It's a, it's a collaborative effort to, to come to the conclusion of figurative. Um, and so that was a kind of beautiful relationship between the two, um, the two things there. Yeah, Anna, you've got a question back there. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> uh, something I've always been interested in in terms of your work is the element of time. And just wondering if you could kind of elaborate, <clears throat> excuse me, on the multifaceted nature of time within your work, you know, the time of the actual piece themselves, 
the time that you know you spend making the thing, the time that the viewers have with it, and then just kind of its time in the spaces that they occupy. So sure, yeah, that's super important to me. Thinking about it all the time. You know, someone was asking me on the bottom of um, of cave painting, like, are those what are the? So those are actually operative. We need them. If you open the window and or the door, if the thing would be flying all over their weights but they are remnants from the studio. So it's important to me that you know, they're really just things that are pulled from the studio. So it's this idea of bringing the time of making a work. Um, those of you who make work in this room, you know there's like this very intense time where you're in your studio alone or with some other people, but you're making work. You bring people into the studio, that changes it. You, but when you bring work into a public, you install, and then there's this moment where you see people you know, actually interact with the work. And these are really dramatic chapters in a creative experience. And so to collapse that, so that you're having kind of the intimacy of a studio visit. Um, you know, one of the things I always say is like, if you say, oh, you could go to, a, you know, an Agnes Martin show, or you could go to her studio. I'd be like, studio, I'll go to the studio. Because that's where you see this happen. That's where you, it's about intimacy and process. So to try and bring intimacy and process into the, into the gallery is important. And then as Jed said, like uh, we talked about, the piece down here, actually we had, I had to make it a studio because it didn't work. Like it worked in my studio and then it just didn't work in that space the way I thought it would. Um, the cave painting actually worked like, to me, was like almost better than I thought it could be because I was sort of concerned like, can it hold this space? It's just, it's just and, we, and when cave painting is like, I thought maybe it would be like seven layers. Mm -hmm. And after three, I was like, no, three's interesting because it's like you want it to kind of barely be holding together. Mm -hmm. You want it to be right on the verge of like a, a Grecian urn where you've got seven pieces and you have to like figure out how to make, you know, this thing alive by having, you know, or, you know, um, you know, the filling or I'm always fascinated by when you go to like the Met and there's all these sculptures without heads and you totally accept that, <laughs> that you're in, you know, you, you, ex you actually expect it. That's now become what we expect. Um, so uh, it was, it was an important thing in the process to say, no, no more, like we want that kind of, long, again, you want the longing for more. You want the audience to put together um, this piece in their eye um, and that it was like the perfect amount. There's someone also did these amazing pictures, which I recommend, where they stood on the other side and photographed someone, photographed them, and they became, you become a photograph in the piece. <laughs> so that was, that was something I'd never seen, that was. As you were scrolling through Instagram, photos no, a of friend this. of mine showed it to me. But it was amazing because oh, wow. cool. it because your iPhone flattens it, and so and you look like a you look like your collage. A collage. Yeah. <laughs> it was a good one. I yeah. didn't know that would happen. Nice. Um, but that was just one of many sort of thought. I mean, I said the the time. I will just say one thing: the obvious piece of time in the in for me was that the tree is not a, in my mind a complete. Representation, representation of a tree, it's actually supposed to be a timekeeper because it, if you spend time with it, you see that it's dead, it's, it's winter, spring, summer, fall, and in, it's actually all of these times supposed to be in one moment. So it, again, it has to do with like the, the thing itself is a clock. Um, and I said this and it's so fun, it's just funny to me because it seems like I learned this about Dallas is that people here all said to me that um, you can have four seasons in a day. <laughs> and I was like, I didn't know that, but it's sort of like the four seasons in a day. That, would have been, that could have been a great title too, four <laughs> seasons in a day. I think, um, yeah, why don't we go? Oh, hi, I have the mic. Uh, you were discussing the kind of changes that happened while you were working on site, but I think I wanted to go backwards a little bit and starting with when you're about to work in a new space mm -hmm. and your, your process from photographing, are you building things to scale completely? Mm -hmm. And then are you photographing them? Because mm -hmm. it's really mm -hmm. challenging to reproduce an installation. Mm -hmm. So I'm really interested in kind of the nuts and bolts of sure. your process with sure. the space from beginning sure. to then. No, it's a great question. Um, so. Um, first of all, we can't always, like the, the Guggenheim was like an incredible uh, challenge because 
um, those spaces are completely deceptive in size. Like one of those bays is, is, is about as wide as this room. And you think it's, and then you have this oculus behind you. So your sense of space is totally different, right? Um, like the, the Nashers also weirdly, you, you think things are bigger than or smaller in different places because of the windows, um, because of the length, because you enter the rooms through the center. That's very unusual to have these like each room. You, and so, um, so each space had its challenges. Um, I could not build the Nasher or the Guggenheim in my space. So, but I would build parts of it to, to, so that I knew for certain spaces, like for the Guggenheim, I built, I did build a ramp, yes. and I painted on a ramp, and I the, the paint dripped on the ramp, and then I realized, oh, this is interesting because um, the sculpt, the the paint is acting sculpturally. Mm -hmm. So actually, then photographed that painting and put it on the edge, the the like the uh, the we called it the Holbein in the studio because Holbein <laughs> did those incredible, you know, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, optical illusions where you have mm -hmm. to stand in one place. Um, so, and that was something that was really important that I couldn't do live because you have these, you have these limited windows because museums need to stay open. Um, they can't be closed, for, you know, to their audience that long. Um, so it really depends on the institution. So I, I didn't think I needed to build a model for, I'm doing a show in Venice at Victoria Mo Miro Gallery. It's a tiny room. And I, I thought, I, I know how to do this. And then there was a moment where I was like, no, I need, it's so small that I actually need to understand. And I, um, and I built it and I realized, oh, what I'm putting in here is way too big because it, like, it, you can't back up from it. But we, I built it out of foam core mm -hmm. uh, just to get like, the scale um, of, the, of the model in the space. Um, when I did SF MoMA, like the, mm -hmm. the Oculus, which I think was the first piece Jed saw in like 2000, I couldn't build the Oculus, but I built like each place where I was going to put the five different pieces of sculpture so that when we got there, we knew how to attach it um, so sometimes it's just pieces. Um, so it really depends on what that space needs. I don't know if does that answer your question, but I think the more we prepare before, the the better, the the more opportunity there is to like then tear the piece apart and make you know and change it on site. Yeah. Phyllis, did you have a question? Oh, I did. Yeah. Have, have you arrived at Terminal B at LaGuardia yourself as a traveler? And how do you feel when you're going down the escalator? <laughs> okay. um, many times, I think I did come here and I'm going to go home. Um, that, I, I, it's great. Um, that was a really hard piece to do. It was in the middle of COVID. Um, I, I was actually just how quickly the world changes. It was Governor Cuomo office called me and said, this is going to open. We're opening an airport. You're an essential worker. Get down there and put this thing up. <laughs> and I had a hazmat suit on. I remember driving there and it was, there was not a person in sight. Um, I told my crew, it's up to you. you no know, one has to work on this project. I, I totally get it. And everyone was like, OK, we're not. <laughs> so I was like, and I was like, cool. So I was like, I actually videotaped myself because I was like, this is so weird. I'm the only person in the world. And, like, and it was interesting. LaGuardia, it was very strange. LaGuardia had was full with homeless people who had figured out that like you could just be there. Yeah. I mean, it was the strain and nobody, I don't think, knew that. Right. Um, and um, we got it up. We put it up and... Um, uh, it's I would with public art I'm I, I would I to me it was really important to and it just was always important to me to have a very diverse practice I because I love things that you can do in a, a private gallery that are super ephemeral and they're going to be protected or you know a museum that has a guard and I love things that you know can garner an audience that doesn't even know it's art um, but with the public ones I, we really go all out we I, I, you know, I don't, um, I, I, I'm really interested in trying to make public art challenging. Again, it's trusting the audience. I think that people underestimate. I think that, I kind of think that, edu that education around art is, creates an, intimi an intimidation around art, that people think they need to know things. Mm -hmm. um, and um, 
I really am interested in, in people seeing art and not knowing it's art. They don't need, I'm, I like making art and no one knows who made it. Um, and um, so we worked really hard on making that something that didn't look like anything anyone had seen. And that's very hard to do because um, of, the, of all of the politics, um, many, anyone who works in the institution, um, anything that's public, you know, things get watered down so quickly. Architecture, this happens in architecture all the time. Um, but, uh, but also something that people don't think about too much, I think, is that with those kind of pieces, you need to work with fabricators and engineers. Um, and for them to put in bids for something they have no idea how to build mm -hmm. is very hard because they don't want to lose money. So that piece is like incredibly hard to build. Um, and I, I worked with a fabricator who's incredible um, and, and is, is a good friend, um, Adam Kamins. He runs a company named Amunil, and he he wants to. He never worries about losing money on a piece, that, and that's very rare. And so that's why we could, because I, I don't think anything's actually been physically built like that, um, because it's a, it's a void. Um, so it had to, but it's supposed to feel extremely light, right? But it's really, it, what's, what I like about it is it's, it's actually a sculpture nesting a void. And it's all of the pictures in it are the pictures of the sky over New York over time. So noon is in the middle. So it's also a timekeeper. But structurally, to have it be that fragile, like it's actually the bottom to get, to have a, stri a very thin strip come down and then cantilever out like that. Um, and not do this is very, very hard. So it's woven like a very, very, you know, it's like, it's like weaving a basket out of stainless steel and then polishing it all. If any of you have polished stainless steel. <laughs> so, and that's, you know, it's much time. easier to make, you know, public art that is, that we've seen before because the, yeah. it's really hard to get fabricators to take the risks that, because they can't afford to, it's, so it's really hard. So it, that's a very special collaboration. So yeah, and I really wanted you on the exit to when you come down and see it that way. So I was really happy with that, how that worked. That was part of, and that's, that is the architectural training. You know, so if you guys have been there, you're like, you come and it's the beginning, but when you depart, it's really weird because you go through the exit and, as you, and you have this sense, and I actually love an escalator for watching art. I love that about the old MoMA where you saw the garden and you were on the escalator because there's something really interesting about, it's like being in a train where you, where you know you don't have to move, but you're moving and watching it. So I love the exit on, at LaGuardia. <laughs> well, Sarah. Thank you so much for that's the exit. <laughs> it, it, exactly. <laughs> for spending so much time with us. Thank you. <laughs> and, and thank you all for spending this afternoon with us. I, I encourage you to go back out into the galleries and experience these works of art again um, in person. Thank you. Thanks.